The focus of our presentation is films as historical sources with their own inherent values. During our commentary, mainly you will see excerpts from our film sources with emphasis on the persecution of Jews and the Holocaust. We shall allow speakers to do the talking for us. We would like to make the best use of our time by getting to the point. For the most part, film sources, as well as photographs, are, as a rule, used merely to illustrate statements that have been made. This is true of German as well as international TV documentaries on the history of National Socialism, biographies of its leading figures, the history of persecution, and of the Holocaust. The films are often taken out of their context, the place where they originated. Sometimes, they serve as proof. They are used as a background for interviews with witnesses to history, as well as with historians. Often, they merely serve as what we call a drop zone for texts. As a rule, the same film sources are used over and over, repeatedly. They are symbolic in that they display Nazi flags, parades through Brandenburg Gate, or the concentration camp gates of Buchenwald, Dachau, and Auschwitz. These moving pictures are memorized by the audience. They are immediately identified with and form a connection to well-known themes and statements. They are iconographic, and thus in the meantime, unfortunately a reason not to view them. As film archaeologists, we have chosen to take a different approach. The films used should show the perspectives of their own camera teams. Whenever possible, time and place should be mentioned when using these films. The films are to be placed in their original context. This approach is the result of over 25 years of experience collecting films. We would first like to familiarize you with the archives. The Karl Höfkes archive started in the early 1990s as a film collection on the history of National Socialism. This was created by the historian Karl Höfkes, who was born in 1954. Above all, Karl Höfkes collected private films that were not used in television documentaries until the late 1980s. From the mid-1990s on, Karl Höfkes produced documentaries on the history of the Third Reich with various partners. These were first distributed on VHS and later as DVDs. More than one million copies were sold. Karl Höfkes became a shareholder in Polar Film Video Distribution, which, among other things, also distributed the contemporary documentaries by Spiegel TV. These documentaries first proved to be of interest to the generation of people who had experienced National Socialism firsthand during their youth. Some were members of the NSDAP, the SA, or the Hitler Youth Organization. Some were soldiers in the army and the Waffen-SS. Even in old age, for the most part, this generation was not really critical of the National Socialist movement. In the 1990s, great amounts of amateur filmed material, sometimes even entire film libraries, were left to Karl Höfkes by people from this generation who had grown up under the aforementioned circumstances. During the past 15 years, many of these films were given to Karl Höfkes by the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the World War II generation. These later generations discovered the archive on the Internet. The Karl Höfkes Archives website has over 250,000 visits every month. The grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the war generation often have political convictions quite different from those of their forefathers and do not have a very strong emotional connection to its contents. As a rule, the younger generation does not have the technical equipment needed to view these films. They've only learned about the contents from their families. 
In the meantime, the Karl Höfke's archive has gained international fame among collectors of historical artifacts. Individual films and entire libraries are now being offered. The archive has also been able to obtain very interesting films at different auctions. Hermann Göring's private films, purchased in the United States, are among the major acquisitions of this archive. Increasingly, archives and museums are looking to cooperate. When this occurs, the Karl Höfke's archives pays the expenses for both digitalization and for distribution rights. At present, many heirs of cultural and documentary filmmakers who produced professional films in the years from 1920 to 1960 are delegating the administration and distribution of these films to the Karl Höfke's archive. The Seculum Archive was established by publisher and author Hermann Pölking Eichen in 1999. It was based on more than 30 regional film chronicles on the history of the German states, covering approximately 55% of the territory of the German Federal Republic. This collection consisted of films from the years 1895 to 1955. They were primarily private films, but those of local and regional enterprises and institutions also ended up in the archives. In the years 2006-2007, the 18-hour documentary, The Germans from 1815 to the Present Day, was created with material from the archive. As a mosaic, it recounts German history using over 1,000 film sources. Since 2011, the Seculum Archive has not been expanded. Since that time, Hermann Pölking Eichen has worked in cooperation with Karl Höfkes. In answer to this question, the proceeds from the distribution of these film sources have, for decades, been reinvested in the expansion and the technical ability of the archive. The collection of the archives is currently centered on the following, often overlapping areas. The history of Central Europe from the introduction of film until the years directly following World War II. The history of National Socialism from its outset until 1945. The history of World War II in Europe. The years of the Weimar Republic. The everyday life of German and Austrians from 1895 till 1960, as well as technological history, fashion and leisure time activities. Together, both archives have over 12,000 films with a total length of over 3,000 hours. 90% of these films are from the years 1920 to 1950. Over 70 hours of color films from the years 1936 to 1945 are preserved in the archive. 80% of the amateur film stored has not yet been edited for the purpose of documentation. We would like to show you some clippings of a film source which we have represented for several months. We see a West German city going up in flames. It is September the 30th, 1944. This film was made by amateur filmmaker Gustav Wittler, who documented events in his home city in annual reviews from the mid-30s on. About 30 minutes of these annual reviews were preserved by his family. The originals have been stored for decades in the German National Archive, where copies are available for viewing. Yet even now, worldwide, only 50 seconds of the annual review has ever been included in documentaries. We have had the original film rescanned and completely restored. We are making efforts to have this significant source used in its proper context in the future.
everyday life during those years had something to do with the Holocaust. The fire of 1938 had something to do with the fire of 1944. An amateur filmmaker is filming himself. It is young Henny Wiener, in those days a corporal in the Reich Marine. His entire estate library has been gifted to us by his granddaughter. We are the first ones to have digitised his film in 2.3K. The 8mm colour film shows sailors in the port city of Lipola, Latvia, celebrating aboard a motor gunboat. And Wiener takes his camera along with him on shore leave, which leads to the dunes of the Baltic Sea, near Lepaya, also known as Liebau in German. In one of the scenes that we recently redigitalized, we now see the scene Einsatzgruppe execution, one of the most significant film sources of the Holocaust. During the seven and a half hour documentary, Wer war Hitler? This source has been incorporated in its full length and for the first time has been placed in its proper original context. Ich sah einen langen, tiefen Graben. Am Graben standen SS-Leute und lettische Polizisten in Zivil mit einer Armbinde. Das Gelände war mit Büschen bewachsen und der Boden war sandig. Wir haben etwa anderthalb Stunden der Exekution zugesehen. In dieser Zeit wurden drei bis vier LKWs aus der Stadt zu der Erschießungsstelle gebracht. Dann wurden die Opfer wie Vieh vom Wagen in die Graben getrieben. Im Gänsemarsch mussten jedes Mal die fünf in den Graben laufen. Ein Bootsführer der Kriegsmarine beim Hafenkapitän, Liebau. Mittags besuchte mich ein alter Niedersachse, der Oberst Scheer. Unter den Dingen, die er erzählte, war besonders die Schilderung einer Erschießung von Juden. Schauerlich. Er hat sie von einem anderen Oberst, ich glaube Tippelskirch. Ernst Jünger, Hauptmann, Paris, Tagebuch. Die Erschießung fand unter der Aufsicht der SS statt. Die Opfer standen mit dem Gesicht zu uns. Ich habe noch genau in Erinnerung, dass nach der Salve die Opfer zusammenbrachen. Ein Bootsführer beim Hafenkapitän Liebau. Schreiben an den SS- und Polizeiführer Liefland, Kommandeur der Ordnungspolizei Riga, 3. Januar 1942. Die in der Berichtszeit durchgeführte Exekution der Juden bildet immer noch das Gesprächsthema der hiesigen Bevölkerung. Vielfach wird das Los der Juden bedauert und es sind zunächst wenig positive Stimmen für die Beseitigung der Juden zu hören. Unter anderem ist das Gerücht im Umlauf, dass die Exekution gefilmt worden sei. SS und Polizeistandortführer Liebau. Does film depict life more naturally than photographs? In other words, do we all agree that moving pictures, film, move an audience more strongly than photos? To date, there is no film source showing an extermination camp prior to its liberation. A color movie of a roll call in Dachau does, in fact, exist. And we have few films of concentration camp inmates during deployment to labor camps. We cannot show mass murder on film. We know in Auschwitz, filming and taking photos was forbidden. However, that does not mean that films were in fact not made. Here, we still have a gap. Many TV documentaries fill these spaces with interviews, in the form of pictures, reenactments, or even graphic novels, not to mention the few existing photographs. We would like to show you how film sources on everyday life, together with eyewitness reports, can close this gap in a highly emotional way. 
We work with parallels between the image and the text. A scene just like the many hundreds which can be found in our archive. A father is filming his large brood of children during furlough in 1941. In the chapter Massenmörder of the seven-and-a-half-hour documentary Wer war Hitler, it was used in the following manner. Each person bade farewell to life in his own way. Some prayed, others drank. Yet all night long, mothers lovingly cared for travel provisions, washed their children, and at dawn the barbed wire was full of children's clothing hung to dry in the wind. They also thought about toys and the hundreds of small things that children always needed. Wouldn't you do the same thing? If one were to kill you and your child tomorrow, wouldn't you give him something to eat today? Primo Levi, chemist, Jewish-Italian partisan, notes in the freight car on the way to Auschwitz. We are now going to demonstrate the same principle to you once more. Not on the topic of the Holocaust this time, but rather on the topic outbreak of the war. Technically, this example is an outstanding source. Otherwise, it is completely apolitical and unspectacular. Nevertheless, it is actually from August of 1939. Am 19. August beginnen Christel und Willi Höse aus Leipzig ihre Hochzeitsreise, eine Kanuwanderung auf der Oder im oberschlesischen Ratibor. Mit dabei Willis Kamera. Im Rückblick auf den Sommer 1939 erkenne ich, dass ich praktisch nichts von den geheimen Annäherungen Nazi-Deutschlands an die Sowjetunion bemerkte. William L. Shira. US-Journalist. Zwölf Tage paddeln die frisch vermählten Leipziger die Oder hinunter. In dieser Zeit treibt Adolf Hitler den Kontinent in einen Weltkrieg. Tagebuch Paris, 19. August 1939. Ankündigung eines deutsch-russischen Nicht-Angriffspaktes. Thea Sternheim. Ende Juli legten Außenminister Rippentrop und Staatssekretär von Weizsäcker mit Zustimmung Hitlers die Grundlagen für eine Vereinbarung mit der Sowjetunion fest, die schon die Teilung Polens und der baltischen Staaten umfasst. Hitler hat es eilig, denn im Herbstregen glaubt er im rückständigen Polen, keinen motorisierten Krieg führen zu können. Am 19. August hat Stalin Hitlers Hand ergriffen, nachdem Hitler ihm eine Interessensphärung-Teilung im Baltikum in den Schoß gelegt. Wenn aber, notierte ich mir, Ribbentrop nach Moskau reist, so bedeutet das, Russland lädt Hitler zum Angriff auf Polen ein. Ernst von Weizsäcker, Staatssekretär im Auswärtigen Amt. Erinnerungen. Telegramm an den Reichskanzler Deutschlands, Herrn A. Hitler, 21. August 1939. Ich danke für den Brief. Ich hoffe, dass deutsch-sowjetischer Nichtangriffspakt eine Wendung zur ernsthaften Besserung der politischen Beziehungen zwischen unseren Ländern schaffen wird. Die Sowjetregierung hat mich beauftragt, Ihnen mitzuteilen, dass sie einverstanden ist mit dem Eintreffen des Herrn von Ribbentrop in Moskau am 23. August. J. Stalin. Tagebuch, 22. August 1939. Der Führer sagte vor etwa vier Jahren in meiner Gegenwart zu einem Ausländer, er könne nicht mit Moskau zusammengehen, weil es nicht möglich sei, dem deutschen Volk das Stehlen zu verbieten und zugleich mit Dieben Freundschaft zu halten. Alfred Rosenberg, Leiter des Außenpolitischen Amtes der NSDAP. Tagebuch Sonntag, 27. August 1939. Briefwechsel zwischen Hitler und Chamberlain. Hitler will Danzig und den Korridor für Deutschland. Henriette Schneider.
Drückend schwüle Tage voll von Angst und Erwartung. Große Stille. Nur noch wenig Autos. Aber Züge. Züge. Fast ununterbrochen. Schrill pfeifend. Man kann nichts tun. Nichts denken. Nichts fühlen als nur das eine. Keinen Krieg. Marie-Luise Kaschnitz. Schriftstellerin. Aufzeichnungen. Am 30. August gelangen Christel und Willi Höse ins Oderdelta und nach Stettin. Der Hafen. Hier liegen KDF-Kreuzfahrer als Lazarettschiffe unter den Schutz des Roten Kreuzes gestellt. Am Tag nach der Ankunft der Hochzeitsreisenden in Stettin beginnt der Zweite Weltkrieg. Willi Höse wird am nächsten Tag Soldat. In conclusion, we dare to make a forecast. During this decade, we have received more amateur films than ever before. In our 25 years of experience as film archaeologists, we believe now that only a small portion of the films made between 1930 and 1945 have found their way to archives. We are familiar with some of the film treasures still in existence and have no doubt they will enable us to close a number of existing gaps. Thank you very much for your attention.